My name is Kristen. I'm going to talk to you about disruptive design. And I really want you to take away from this workshop the fact that often people think of activism as, you know, going out screaming in the streets and, and holding up signs, very clever signs at that, you know, or chaining yourselves to trees. But I want to talk a little bit about how you can use what you do every day here to really impact change. So the first question is, what is activism? So when I think of it, well, up until this moment, I usually thought about, you know, those people who are sitting down at lunch counters and refusing to get up until they were served. You know, I thought about those people who marched around with the signs or people organizing in their local communities and getting people to sign petitions. But now when I think about it, I think about all of that, but I think about people like Angela Davis, you know, fighting against bigotry, fighting against racism and systemic oppression. I think about Mother Teresa and all the amazing things she's done in different communities, trying to dispel the belief that you're better than anyone else, your fellow man, right? I think about Stephen Hawking and how he challenged us to really dispel the belief that because you are physically limited, you are also mentally limited. What are some people that you think about when you think of activism? Can I get a couple volunteers? You just heard about activism today. That's the snap. Look at me dropping knowledge. Okay, no, go ahead. Say it again. And who's that? Who's that? <laughs> okay. Oh, that, I'm gonna have to look that one up. Okay. Anybody else? No? Yeah? Uh, his counterpart is Cornel West. My turn, was it? Yeah. Uh, his counterpart is Cornel West, also. Uh, activist author, more famous back in the 90s, currently, I think, at Harvard or whatever. Okay, awesome, awesome. And really quick, what do you both do? What are your, what's your position? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I work in uh, support uh, integration here, um, so getting data out of the internet, the other applications. Nice, okay. Yeah, I work in uh, operations. Nice. Okay. All right. Awesome. So those are great, great examples. And they kind of get into the definition that I have here. So activism is taking action to affect social change. So you talked about that too with the coders. You talked about that with Cornell West. It's about seeing the change that you want to see in the world and, and taking some type of steps to make sure that you can actually influence that change, right? So what I did notice today is that neither of you said yourselves. Right? And nobody else in here said yourselves. Maybe you're just mad humble. And on the, on the weekends, you're still out there like, yeah. But what I've realized is, even though when we think about activists and we think about activism and we think of the Cornell West and the T-Code, T-Codes, uh, oh. But um, when we think of Cornell West and T-Codes, we, we often don't align them with what we're doing every day, you know? But when I think of activism now, I think about people who are up at the boards, doing storyboards, doing wireframes, doing different things that uh, will help them create software. I think about innovation. Innovation is very closely related to activism. Both activism and innovation have to do with bringing about change. Yet for some reason, when we think about activism, we barely think about ourselves. This is a great product that I thought, maybe some of you actually know about it. It's called the Wonder Sphere. And basically what it is, it's, it's a, a little environment that you can put different toys in, and it'll clean the toys so that kids that are unfortunately in the hospital with different um, d diseases where they're very vulnerable to uh, colds or different, different ailments, they can actually interact with the, the objects that you put in the environment. This is activism. And often we don't think about that. There are different ideas that people have going around in the environment. How can I make sure that I design a product that allows people to get access to clean water? You know, I think the people in Flint, Michigan, for instance, would really appreciate that. When we think about environmental advocacy, we think about, OK, how can I make sure that I can keep the environment safe, but also get uh, people transported from point A to B? We think about cybersecurity. How can we make sure that our information is protected? 
That's advocacy. That's activism. Lastly, another example is when we think about, I don't know how many of you actually live in the city of Boston. Live in the city of Boston? OK, all right, we got some believers. We got some believers in the house. All right, cool. Whenever you go to different cities, because there's so many people in, uh, in one closed area, you have to think about, OK, how can I impact their lives? How can I make it so that this is a great place to live, it's a safe place to live, a clean place to live? That's social impact. And that requires a lot of design. So a little bit about my story. Again, my name is Kristen Ransom. I um, started INCLUDE, which stands for Inclusive Design and Development, because I, since the beginning of my life, honestly, even when I was a little fetus, I was like, yeah, I want to make a difference. I want to make a change. But everyone told me, you know, you have to either choose between making a difference, being an activist, or being an engineer. So I was like, activists don't make no money, so. No, just kidding. Um, they can make a little bit of money. But I chose, you know, I was like, let me be an engineer. So I went to Tufts with Emma, and I was very focused. I said, all right, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer. I'm going to focus on, you know, everything that has to do with engineering and creating different products. And even throughout my career at Tufts, people kept telling me, just focus. Don't get involved in whatever things are going on on campus. Don't get involved in different movements. You have to graduate. You have to create products, get a job, get uh, the whole way through. But what I realized is that even though it is impossible to make a sustainable and, and really impactful, um, a really big impact on a movement if you're jumping from thing to thing, you can use your talent that you have to actually make a difference. So what I did was I started this company, and we do web design and web development for different social impact organizations. So by virtue of just working with a lot of the clients that we work with, we're able to help them further their own movement. So a couple of the clients that we ha we've had, this is one group called BAMS Fest, and their mission was really to kind of get out the message about different um, musical genres in the African diaspora. So they talked about R&B, hip hop, jazz, um, things like that, and they put on different performances. But their thing was they had a really hard time gaining traction in Boston. So they didn't have a website. We built them a website. And since then, they've put on, I believe, three different con uh, concerts. So they have an annual uh, concert going and various events around the city. You should look them up, because they got a website. <laughs> Another group that we worked on um, was called Overcoming Racism. And they're a startup that basically puts on different equity and inclusion workshops all around um, New Orleans. And their thing was, you know, often in different schools, you'll have teachers who are very well-meaning, but they don't know how to address the, the issues that their students are facing. Especially if you're, you're dealing with a diverse group, every single person has a very different background and, and environment that they're living in. So they put on different workshops about equity and um, justice to help students and teachers cope with different things that are going on. They also didn't have a website, so we made from one for them. And one of the interesting things with this was figuring out how do you how do you kind of display the, the different issues that are going on with um, racism and bigotry without it being too disheartening? We wanted to have a, a presence that made it uh, clear the different issues that they were working on, but gave people hope and, and invited people to actually volunteer and get involved with the organization. One um, other organization that we worked with it's called Liberty Square. I don't know if you guys have been to Miami. Anybody been to Miami? The struggle is real. Oh, OK, all right, there we go. I haven't actually been to Miami, so I really want to go. But we had a client that uh, actually was redeveloping a um, neighborhood there that's called Liberty Square. And it's a historically very um, uh, oppressed neighborhood, very underrepresented, um, underserved. And they were redeveloping the entire community, so building new uh, establishments, new apartments, uh, putting in real estate, or rather retail, commercial spaces. And this was one of the things that we tried to do to gain uh, more visibility for their movement. The main point of all of these examples was 
I definitely wasn't carrying no sign. <laughs> I wasn't out, you know, broadcasting, you know, no justice, no peace. I didn't have to do all that, even though I have the voice for it. I didn't have to do all that. And I think one of the very inspiring things is that it doesn't matter what field you're in, what, uh, what your specific title is, you can find different ways to actually impact change in the, in the role that you're in. And the main way that you can do that is by using human-centered design. So I don't know if there are any human-centered design people. You focus on that. That's your jam. Ah, there you go. Be proud. Woo! Human-centered design. If you look on here, it's basically understanding that you can make a difference no matter what your role is and using a specific set of steps that keep the user involved at every point in the process. So I don't know about you, but I've definitely experienced so many different products where I'm like, who did you test this with? You obviously tested this with no one. You asked your mom, she said, heck yeah, son, I got you. And you <laughs> broke the thing. And it's horrible. So I don't know if you guys have any examples. I have about five million. But any examples that you can think of of horribly designed products? You picked up the mic. You're forced now. That is horrible design, too. That's horrible, like, stock price dropping design. Yeah, um, that, that is really true. I mean, part of design isn't, it isn't always about the aesthetic, right? It isn't always about how things look, but it also comes to what's the concept and um, what type of message are you trying to portray. So the Rihanna thing was pretty offensive. So that's definitely one, uh, one example of poor design. Yep. <laughs> um, I think another example is uh, when Siri couldn't recognize accents or when the facial recognition software on iPhones like, couldn't recognize other races. Mm. So an example of this kind of probably the bottom of your head down the south of our demographics. Yes, definitely, definitely. And that kind of goes at the core of human centered design, which is you're not the only human, right? It's about understanding the different cultures that you're serving, the different audiences that you're serving. So that's a great example. I'll tell you, unless anyone else has one, one example that I saw the other day was I, um, I have two beautiful kids. You can look them up on Instagram. But um, I have two beautiful kids, and I have this huge stroller to fit them in. And I was walking into a building. I got to the ramp. I walk all the way up the ramp with the stroller and there's no handicap accessible, you, you can't open the door automatically. So I was struggling to get it, and I looked to my left, all the way at the other end of the building, where the stairs are, there's a handicap accessible door. I'm like, I'm gonna punch you. <laughs> but this is, this is prime example in, in that I'm not even necessarily that core audience, right? I, I'm thankful that I don't have a physical uh, limitation in that way. But when you design with the user first, and you design to actually inc include people who are on either end of the spectrum, everyone begins to benefit, you know? So when you follow the human design, uh, human-centered design process, the first step in that is empathy. And I don't mean you need to go sing Kumbaya and cry together. That's not even it. It's empathy is about understanding what your user is feeling and using that to design an experience that works in, in their realm of thinking, right? The next step is after you actually understand who your user is, you can define the problem. Often, even in a lot of different movements that we're in, people are too busy shouting over each other, they don't get an understanding of where either party is coming from. So it's impossible to define the problem. After you're able to define the problem, it's only then that you can actually ideate. You can actually develop different concepts to solve whatever that problem is. Next thing that you'll do is actually develop some type of MVP, minimum viable product, or some type of uh, test, a prototype, that helps you see, does this actually work, right? And then, of course, you test it. So when we think about designers as being activists, these are the four main things that I think about. You solve complex problems, right? So I'm sure you guys are working on plenty of amazing things in your work. I don't know if K-12 
can you share it? Will I, you know, will you have to take me out if I know? Or I don't know, but <laughs> uh, can someone share like an interesting project that they're working on? Yes, okay. Um, I work on, I'm a designer, I work on um, registration and um, some work was done last year and now it's been passed on to my team to incorporate transgender fields um, for patients who are transgender which we haven't had before so it not only records um, the correct information about a patient and how they identify and how they would like to be addressed but it also helps registration staff members um, speak correctly and like address, like treat patients correctly, maybe they haven't ever encountered a transgender Wow. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. And that's definitely a great example of, you know, solving, solving different problems and accelerating change. I think often when people think about different social issues, if they're not directly in that group who's impacted, it's easy to just say, you know what, that's the way it is. Just kind of have to get over it, right? The thing that they're also doing in your example is engaging communities. You know, you're engaging the physician, you're engaging the different, um, the, the different people involved and letting them know uh, the different things that are important to those groups of people. And you're creating an impact. So one thing I want us to do, I probably should have done this earlier, but I want everyone to take a couple notepads. Oops. Oh, thank you. Look at that. Oh, perfect. Oh, sweet. Hopefully this is enough. If not, use your hand. It'll wipe off. <laughs> oh, do you have pens? Sorry, just... Obviously, I thought you just had pens just attached to you at all times. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the first step is empathizing, right? Really understanding who is your target audience, what do they care about, what are, their, um, what are some things that prime them, that trigger them to feel different types of emotions? You know, a lot of times, depending on what culture the person comes from or what their background is, these things can be different. You know, how you perceive uh, different people, especially um, when it comes to gestures. In some communities, maybe this is a, a welcoming, you know, gesture like, hey, what's up? You know, in others, it's kind of, uh, uh, an idea that I'm closing myself off to you. Um, when you have to think about the environment of your user, you know, what, is, what are the types of things that they're doing on a daily basis? What are things that are important to them? And again, what are uh, the, control, the cultural implications of that? So one thing I want you to do with your notepad, if you have pens, oh, thank you for the, the expo markers. Woo. I want you to think about a user group that you interact with daily. So if you were students, maybe I'd say, okay, you're professors. Or you can say parents. I don't know what your specific job is. Yours might be doctors. So just think about that group and write it down. And after you've written down that group, just write down one or two key notes about what you observe about them. You know, what do they do pretty often? What is the interaction like? All right, awesome. So the next step is defining the problem. Right? So what are the problems that your audience is experiencing? So sometimes we'll see that there are supposed to, supposedly solutions for those problems, but sometimes there's something missing. So for that same group you just wrote about, answer these three questions. What are the problems that your audience is facing? What are the current solutions? And then what's missing from those solutions? So what's the point of all this? You're probably like, all right, she has this right on sticky notes, when, what's going on here? Interesting thing about solving problems is that, I'll give an example, actually. The reason why we're, we kind of spend all this time solving problems, there was this study done a while ago, like before you know, there, were, there were regulations on what you could do to people and animals. Um, they had this study on dogs. They put two dogs in two different rooms, and they put 
they made a, a sound go off. And whenever that sound go off, went off to one dog, if he jumped, they would zap his feet when he came back down. For the other dog, they didn't do anything to him. Then they put those same two dogs in front of a little barrier. They had conditioned the dog at the top that any time he jumped up and tried to get away or go anywhere, that he would get zapped. And the other dog, they did nothing. After a while, they kept on doing that sound, and they found that the dog on the bottom that hadn't been conditioned not to want anything else, not to go any further, not to push back, he jumped right over. For the top one, what he did was he was so conditioned to be punished whenever he tried to get more, to be punished whenever he tried to push back the expectations of others, he sat down and got into a state of helplessness. So this is called learned helplessness. And it may seem like a very, uh, it may seem like a, a weird kind of foreign concept, but this is something that we've all gone through. You know, anytime you use a product that you're like, this is so horrible, I'm so frustrated with this, pro this product, but yet you keep using it, that's learned helplessness. So the, the main facets of that is you have this idea that they're uncontrollable bad events. You have a, a, an idea that you can't do anything to, to solve that or to, to fix the problem. And then you learn that helpless behavior. But what's important about that is instead of going into that state of helplessness, you ideate. So there are a couple of methods that I want to try out today. So the first one is facilitated out, uh, out loud thinking. And that is going to involve more sticky notes. Yay. <laughs> the second one is called brain writing. And this is basically you kind of drawing on a paper different ideas you have for a solution. And then the last one is called reverse brainstorming. And this one's really fun. Um, and I'll explain it when it comes to that. So what I want to do is, so we can do it either, we can do it two, two ways. So we could either choose one of the examples that you gave, and I want us to break into groups and kind of just ideate, you know, come up with different solutions that could be used to solve that problem, or I can give you one um, that is probably far less interesting, but uh, I can give that to you. So I'm going to give you one, because I think it actually is very interesting. <laughs> so in a, in a broader context, the problem is when you are going for an appointment and you have to wait in line, right? So let's break up into groups and use the sticky notes to come up with different solutions for how can we make waiting in line less painful? If it's a long line, what can you do? And there's no, cost is no object, I'm rich as heck, I can afford whatever solutions you give to me. So think about what, what can you do to make uh, standing in line more interesting? And I'm not gonna give any more detail than that. So go for it. This is the first one, the first uh, method, facilitated out loud thinking. So if you guys wanna be a group, and then I guess you guys all, I don't know, you guys just love each other. Just be groups. <laughs> oh, no, we should talk to oh. Yes, okay. Okay, so the next thing I want you to do is just go and put your post-its up here. And if you see another person's post-it that kind of matches yours, like both of yours have to do with telling people how much time is left or making it more fun, then group them together so you can put them up on the wall. That's good. Good. I think that's a good move. I'm just going to go over some of the ideas you had. So we have some workaholics in the house. I think a lot of you said start what you were waiting for, like get a menu. People said do paperwork, so that's really good. <laughs> I'm like, we got some serious people. Um, Pre-check in, call or text when it's your turn. One good one I think we really need more of is a progress indicator of the wait time. Really nice. And then we have a lot of people who are like, just distract the heck out of me so it's not so painful. So distraction with food, personal favorite, good job. I think that's a really good one. Um, Disney approach, estimated wait time signs, entertainment, nice, nice. 
And then, let's see, what else we have? Make the waiting in line more relaxing. Food and bathrooms, wait, I must have read that wrong. Bathrooms in the line, what's happening? <laughs> Whatever. Multitasking, I got you, okay. <laughs> uh, VR headsets, that's really good. Then someone else had changed the line layout. Ah, so there's an interesting like, I don't know, the, like roundabout thing going on. I don't know, that's really cool. And then other people just said, just F the line, just forget it, just eliminate the line altogether. So no one ever has to wait again. I like that one too. Okay, so this is one of those approaches. Again, it's called facilitated out loud, out loud thinking. And most of the time, the rules associated with this are there's no judgment, there's no constraints. So you're not supposed to use this time to say, oh, well, that wouldn't work because of X, Y, and Z. Oh, we can't do this because of A, B, C. So this is really just about getting the, all of the ideas you have just out onto paper and just putting them up. And then what usually happens next is you would organize it into categories and figure out, OK, which type of solution do we want to pursue? So do we want to go with you know, making it so that people are more productive when they're in the line? Do we want to make it so that when they're in the line, they're having more fun so they forget about the wait time altogether? Do we want to just go down with the man, forget about lines, forget about the establishment? I'm down with that. That's another option. So this is, this is one of those great methods. One, um, I don't know if we have much time to do the other two. I can do one more probably. But this one involves the piece of paper that you have. So on the piece of paper, given this same problem, I want you to start drawing one of the solutions that you like. So just start drawing it. Again, there's no judgment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Change it to the, to put your paper to the person to the right. Just switch it. Give the person to your right your paper. <laughs> I know I cheated and I love it. <laughs> and don't explain, don't explain what's going on in the picture. <laughs> By the, by the laughter, I'm sensing we have some artists in the house, and I'm, I really want to see. But so what you're going to do now is don't explain the picture, but I want you to add on top of what that person drew. So imagine what you think the solution is and just add. OK, awesome. Can I get two brave souls? Just two. The dollar is back on the table. If you, <laughs> I'm kidding. I really don't have cash. I never do. But two brave souls, can you present your solution? You can do it. You can do it. OK, get up, get up. So, so show your beautiful drawing. I don't know if you can see it from all the way back there, but this is what three of us came up with. Basically, when you're in line, you get headphones and you participate in a silent disco. So much fun that it's your turn, you don't want to go. <laughs> okay, give her a hand. That was beautiful. I, everybody loves disco. <laughs> okay, second brave soul. Yep. Uh, so I think there's a that waits in line for you. So, so these people. <laughs> and you're working on a tablet that might be on wheels. <laughs> There's some sort of tub full of liquid down here. And you bought it. Cool. So that mostly, they tend to, my, my contribution is uh, fireworks. <laughs> When in doubt, add fireworks. I, yeah. I, love, I love the sense of danger there. I love it. OK, all right, perfect. So again, this one is called brain writing. And it's really good if you have introverts in the group or you have people who need a little bit. I know I didn't give you much time, but if they need a little bit of time to themselves to think about different ideas, it kind of lightens up the mood, helps you not think so much again about the limitation, but just think about boundless innovation. So these are just two different ideas that you, can, um, that you can take to really come up with different ideas that'll, that might solve your problems. Reverse brainstorming is one of my favorites because it's really good, just like um, brain writing is really good for introverts and then facilitated um, out loud thinking is great for people who are very extroverted. 
reverse brainstorming is really good for people who are naturally cynical. So if you're like, you know what? A great idea for the line is if you, you have the wait time listed and then you just increase it by an hour and just don't tell anybody why, you know? <laughs> or a great thing for, for the line would be if all of a the sudden they close one, the line that you're in and tell you you need to go to another one. So what, the great thing about reverse um, brainstorming is that it gets people who sometimes aren't great at coming up with actual ideas, it gets them involved, and then you can pretty much do the opposite. <laughs> you know? So it, it actually is a really good tool in the very beginning, in the uh, concept stage. So main, main point, again, with this is you are not you are not limited at all by, um, the only, only person that's limiting your innovation is yourself, honestly. I think we have so many social issues in this world that every one of us is, that maybe you're, you're very in tune with. So you can honestly use the talents that you have here, the talents that maybe people don't even know you have to design a solution. So hopefully this, uh, this has given you a little bit more inspiration to do so. So thank you and let me know if you have any questions.